Everybody give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Brent White. And I'm Tim Roberts. And basically what we're going to talk about today is anybody that's getting into uh, InfoSec or maybe if you're a developer and you want to figure out what to, the kind of the path to take to start learning how to secure your own applications and code, we're going to basically walk through what happens all the way from client kickoff to report delivery. And uh, so it'll be a lot of high level information, but definitely enough to get you in the right direction uh, to assessing web apps. All right, so a few things. Uh, when you guys do your kickoff call, uh, usually this happens after um, a client, everything you've decided on your statement of work. Uh, the kickoff call kind of bridges the gap from the actual penetration assessment and, uh, and that statement of work. So during this call, uh, it's often when you're developing the rules of engagement. Um, that's when you discuss your scoping, uh, you discuss limitations, and your, your points of contact. So let's say, um, you know, for the scoping, if it's a PCI uh, kind of assessment, then some, you know, the scoping may be broader or bigger. So these are the kind of questions you want to ask your client is, what are you guys looking at? Why are you doing this assessment? Is it just for a checkbox or, you know, do you want a deep dive? Um, and also during this for the point of contacts, uh, this is for both the client contacts and of course the testers. So if you were to knock over a box or the application, who do you contact during that time? Or who do they contact? How do you get in touch with each other? Um, and you'll also do the limits as far as when is the testing? Is it okay to do automated scanning 24 by 7? Or is it production environment and they only want the heavier automated stuff done after hours? Things like that. Uh, you'll also want to make sure to ask the client, hey, are, are there any pages or functions that you want us to avoid? You know, maybe there's a contact form that if you put an automated scanner on it, some poor soul is going to have thousands of emails in their inbox. So you want to make sure to ask those things and get those details uh, from the start. And so something to keep in mind is that at the end of every assessment, a report is going to be expected. And I only mention this because when I started the job, I made the mistake of not collecting enough evidence. And so while I was trying to write the report, I realized there were several things that I didn't document fully and kind of, you know, had to, like a dog tucking its tail, had to go back to the client and say, hey, I know the assessment's over, but it's not really because I screwed up. Can I have some more time? Can you pr provide more access? And so just to save you from that embarrassment, just keep in mind that they will expect a report and document as much stuff as possible. And as far as documentation goes as well, um, you know, Brent had done a web application talk before and a QSA approached him afterwards and said, hey, you know, uh, PCI stuff, something that I see a lot of is a uh, pen test report will come in for a PCI requirement. And it doesn't mention anything about PCI. It doesn't have the OWASP checklist. It doesn't have anything like that in the report. So I've had to decline those reports for uh, PCI requirements. So uh, that, this is just kind of a mention for that. So whenever you guys are doing these reports, again, uh, go back to the scope. Why are you doing this? What is the client wanting? And try to tailor it uh, to, to help them when they're presenting for auditors and, and things like that. Yeah, and you, you'll also make sure to mention, see, uh, Tim said the OWASP top 10. Put on there, uh, of the top 10 things, what did they pass, what did they fail? Mention when the assessment took place, and also mention what the whole, the whole goal of the project was and what you look for. So those things will help uh, your report from being rejected from your QSA. Uh, as far as evidence gathering, again, um, something that I use, uh, well, a lot of us use, is KeepNote. Uh, KeepNote is a nice built-in uh, kind of project manager. You can put folders and subfolders. You can paste screenshots, and it's just kind of a nice reference to keep uh, going back to as you're performing your assessment. So you remember, hey, what were my requests? What was my HTTP request? What was this or that? Screenshots, things. Exactly. And a great thing, one of the reasons I prefer KeepNote too, is that if a client wants to see all of your raw data, you know, outside of the report, all you have to do with this is just export it as HTML and you can just give everything to them so they're not having to install a new program to see all your files. And it's also available, it comes pre-installed in Kali, but it's also available for Windows and OS X platform too, so. And just to kind of give you an idea of how I group things, how, how I collect evidence, is that um, 
you can see, so if I have several hosts that I'm looking at for, for an assessment, then I might group it by the host. So on the left side, you can see each host has its own folder and then each vulnerability I found under that host. Or if, it, if it's just one or two or you know, easy enough to keep up with, I'll just group it by vulnerability. Uh, I've changed how I've done this several times over the years and this seems to be the method I've stuck with the longest. So you'll just kind of figure out as you go what works best for you. Um, and you can also see I've color coded them and this gives me just a quick visual reference of kind of the state of the application or where I'm at. Uh, so like the, the darker red would be your high or criticals uh, and then the red would be your serious, yellow would be medium and so on. The green, I know the green isn't a vulnerability but it's just reference information for me so the scope or credentials or something that I might, might need to click on quickly. Uh, again, this is just personal preference so it's going to be you're going to figure out what works best for you. Yeah, because this is just to help you stay on track. Um, you know, also with with this, you can include checklists. You can, I mean, there, there's a lot you can do with KeepNote. Um, but again, like Brent mentioned, there's a lot of commercial stuff out there you can get, and there's freeware as well. And you might find out you like you just using Microsoft Word as well. So. Right. <laughs> so evidence gathering, what do you document? So make sure that you document all of your uh, get and post requests as well as the full response. And this will allow the client, whenever they're going through their remediation process, they can basically copy and paste and, and try to you know, get the same results that you got. Um, and this just helps them to see everything you did to get and, and find that vulnerability. Also, uh, you want to document any kind of unscheduled downtime. So let's say you do knock over a system uh, application or something like that. or you know, maybe the client messes up and you're not unable to communicate with the application now. Um, you know, you want to document that kind of stuff. Uh, you want to also um, document any kind of uh, changes that you've made. So let's say you've made some uh, accounts, um, you uploaded, did some SQL injection, created some accounts or modified some tables or something. Uh, you want to make sure that that's documented so that you can go back and clean up any mess that you've left. Yeah, there have been a few times where we've been able to put scripts, you know, shell scripts or something on the the client on the host but we weren't able to actually remove those ourselves so you definitely want to tell the client if you've put a shell script on the host and don't leave it there and then something bad happens so another thing I've actually seen people get in trouble for this don't post any pictures of any hacks that you do from for a client website if you do want to share it make sure you sanitize it so that it's not obvious where it came from just to cover yourself and any non-disclosure agreements that you might be under. You also want to make sure that you're getting relevant legible screenshots of whatever vulnerabilities you're coming across. So uh, whether it's your HTTP request uh, and, and response headers or it's uh, you know a dump of a database or anything like that, anything you put in the report, you want to make sure it helps the client to not only see what you did but go back and be able to duplicate uh, that once they've done their remediation efforts. So uh, an example, <laughs> this is a database dump that I did through SQL injection. There were, there was so much information that I knew, okay, no matter what I do, I can't put all of this, uh, even though I sanitized this enough to put in the report, you have to consider that this image is going to be, have to fit in a printable area for a report. So when you squeeze that down, it's going to be hard to see even the black background with the green text. So what you would want to do in this case, uh, if there's a small area that you can zoom in on, where you can kind of make it a, a bigger screen, like a bigger area for the report, that's fine. Or copy and paste this in the report. And uh, if, so on the next slide, you can see, for example, uh, any code or anything that we have that's actual code that we've sent or received, or for that SQL, uh, dump for instance I would copy and I would paste that in the code area so the client can see it so you just want to make sure that whatever you're putting in there is easily readable for the client you know if we go back to the screenshot you'll see like there's 240 entries in this so obviously you don't want to include everything that you find uh, you can just include a snippet prove your point you know you don't have to put the entire uh, database in the report obviously yeah. Uh, you want to list all known affected pages and parameters for vulnerabilities. Uh, the reason why is, you know, sometimes you'll just put one parameter. 
um, on there. Let's say uh, you ran a Nessus scan or something like that, and you're like, oh, okay, well, that looks vulnerable. You go and you test that parameter, and now you're just talking about that parameter. Did you look at uh, you know, all the affected pages and all the parameters on there? Uh, do they know to look at that, or do they just know to look at the username field or, or, or something? Right. So again, back to this screen, username is vulnerable to SQL injection. Make sure you also test password. Is that vulnerable to SQL injection? or any other parameters that might be in there. Um, and as Tim mentioned, so if username is vulnerable and let's say password happens to be vulnerable too, make sure in the report you're listing all parameters that are vulnerable to SQL injection, for example. So, oh, go ahead, Tim. Right. Yeah, so the evidence gathering, the methodology, uh, the checklist. Uh, if you're new to this stuff, you know, where do I start? Uh, what do I test? Um, there's there's a, not, a lot of nice uh, checklists out there. You know, we mentioned earlier OWASP. Um, you know, you can if you don't have a methodology that you follow within your organization, if you are a pen tester, you know, just Google, look online. There's there's tons of stuff and a lot of references out there. Um, something that this helps is obviously it, it helps you with your, your keeping track, just like Keep Note. It helps uh, with consistency with your reporting, uh, with your testing, and uh, also. When you do this, even though it helps, it can also limit you. So whenever you, um, you make these checklists or you go by it, keep in mind to think outside of the box. Don't just limit yourself to uh, checklist security. Uh, I think I can speak for Brent as well, but checklist security is kind of a joke, right? It's like, oh, we just want a checkbox to say we did this assessment, or we just want to go through this list. And, and you're like a robot. You're, a, you're running a script. Uh, it's not like that. We're, you know, as hackers, as pen testers, we, we're creative. We think outside of the box. We, we want to find new ways of exploiting this stuff. Uh, so make sure you don't limit yourself with that. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to start getting into more of the actual assessment part of the talk. So one of the things that I like to start off with is looking at what's out there on the internet already. So uh, you know, open source intelligence. Several tools out there. Again, this is it's open source. It's free. It's amazing what you can find. Uh, but keep in time. It's very time consuming. So uh, there, there have actually been several times where I've found through old development forums uh, usernames, like test usernames and passwords that they gave to people that they were wanting them to help troubleshoot an issue they had, and those credentials were still valid. And so you know, just go and log into their database. So they or a database schemas or anything. So look for those things. And uh, developers, it's it's cool to get help, you know, with dev uh, dev forms and things like that. But make sure when you do post something for getting help that you sanitize that. And if for whatever reason, if you do provide access to someone that can come in and look at your code, make sure that you disable that once they are finished. Uh, so that guys like us don't find it and give you a terrible report afterwards. So. Uh, also, you know, he was talking about the developer forums. Uh, a lot of the internal application assessments that we do will f come across like a developer wiki. And that wiki, uh, a lot of times, there's, there's a treasure trove of information as far as the kind of applications they're using, uh, like he said, test uh, accounts and, and things like that, and different table names and paths. So uh, don't overlook that kind of stuff. It's like, oh, it's a developer wiki, it's just the developer environment. Uh, it's not production, it's not relevant. Well, the thing is, is I, I personally come across accounts that are the same in the development environment as they are in the production. So when they rolled over, they forgot about those test accounts. So those test accounts still exist. So uh, always keep that in mind. Yeah, and, and you know, when finding those accounts too through, through Google or archived email forums or things, those give you usernames that you can go and try to brute force uh, authentication to the app. So again, we, like we just mentioned, we found the database types, full schemas, test credentials, uh, and things in the wild that were still relevant. So just keep that in mind and look for it. Developers, keep in mind to clean that stuff up. Uh, a few more, a few more tools. Again, there's so many tools out there, but just a few that that we like to use on a regular basis. We re I really like Discover by Lee Baird. As you can see, some of the uh, the options that are available to it. You can quickly scan for a domain, uh, active, passive searching. Uh, you can put in um, the company name and the domain as well, or specific person, and so on. Uh, as well as other cool tools, if you need to parse XML, start a listener, several things that just make it kind of quick and easy for you. So, 
you know, he mentioned other tools. There's uh, uh, Metagoofall right there. There's um, uh, Maltego, Harvester. Um, there's a lot of different tools out there for uh, OSINT gathering. So uh, keep that in mind. Don't limit yourself to just one tool either. Uh, one tool may just have a limited amount of features, while another one may have something that that one missed. So uh, try to use multiple tools, not just one. Why do you run automated tools? You're supposed to be a hacker. Uh, well, one of the things that we do is uh, we run these tools uh, for the sake of time. So unlike real life, uh, where a hacker may have several months uh, or years or whatever to sit there and build upon this, um, as pen testers, often we're given a short amount of testing window. So Like a week, uh, like maybe a week. two weeks. Yeah. So in that, uh, we often run the automated tools, then we'll go back and we'll do some manual stuff, and then we'll start testing the false positives from the automated tools. So even though Nessus may tell you, uh, this is vulnerable to uh, cross-site scripting. Well, you go to it, you test the parameter, and nothing's happening. Well, what, what's, why isn't this popping up? Did you turn your pop-ups off? Is Java disabled and your uh, is script disabled in your browser? I look at that stuff, but also uh, is, is the report just throwing out a, a false positive saying this is vulnerable and all it is is, is, is tripping on one of the, uh, the code or uh, a tick or something. Yeah, so automated scanning really is a quick way to do a wide range of tests to find a lot of low-hanging fruit and kind of gives you, a, a, I guess, a game plan if, if it's showing things of how you want to attack the application after that. So, um, and something that I want to stress is that a Vuln scan is not a penetration assessment. Everybody together. Yeah. A Vuln, Vuln scan, scan is, is not, not a penetration, penetration assessment. And we, uh, we see this a lot of time from uh, larger firms that will sell packages where it's basically a vulnerability scan and they pass it off as pen test. Well, it's not, it's a Vuln scan. Uh, you're going to, it's going to have a lot of false positives. It's not going to have that human interaction, and it's not going to go as deep as you could take it uh, for certain vulnerabilities. So please keep that in mind. Be good stewards and spread the word to anybody that says that otherwise. And to those that say it is. I have no idea what I'm doing. There you go. Uh, so if you guys are receiving 50-page acunetics dumps or something like that, and this is your pen test, I hate to break the news to you, but you're paying for somebody to click go. So yeah. uh, this is not a penetration system. Yeah. Other automated scanners, uh, there's several out there, but some of the, are qu the ones that we go to on a regular basis. So we like Nessus. I like to use Nessus because it's, you know, it does a lot of quick checks on the, on the host level. So it'll look at like CGI, I like it'll look at SSL TLS settings. Um, It'll, you know, it'll help find admin portals or backup pages, things like that. Uh, another thing I like to use to get a deeper dive is IBM AppScan. And again, there, there are several others out there, but just mentioning the ones that, that we use on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, IBM AppScan, you can see it, uh, it checks for several, several things. It's, it's a great application. And, They've got uh, a nice uh, web service test uh, module in it too. So. Yeah. And then Burp Suite Pro, you're going to hear us reference that quite a few times because it's just a, a great tool. It does a wide, wide variety of, of, of testing and, uh, and things. NIC2, that's also another built-in scanner. It comes pre-installed in Kali, and it's going to do quick scans, again, for uh, hidden directories, well-known admin portals, or backup files, uh, CGI vulnerabilities. It, it, covers a, a quick wide range of things too. So if, you, if you've already sort of looked at the application or you're trying to get through something quickly, instead of using, through using an automated scanner like Nessus or IBM AppScan or something, uh, just run NIC2 because it's pretty focused and it's a pretty quick tool. Also uh, looking at this, uh, identify, uh, if you see like frameworks like um, WordPress or something like that. And Drupal, WordPress, Joomla. Or Drupal, um, WordPress is very popular because it's easy, right? It's like a blog management, throw it on there, and, and developers are using it quite often. But what happens is as soon as they hand it off, it's often not maintained. So plugins aren't updated. Uh, they're not updating WordPress uh, or, or Joomla or Drupal. Um, and so this leaves vulnerabilities. So 
make sure if you guys are, are clients and developers are developing this, make sure that you have this patch management, even on uh, stuff like WordPress. Yep. Out of the box, uh, it's okay, but when you start adding plugins and things, you need to learn techniques how to harden that. I don't know, as a pen tester, I absolutely love it. When I see a client's using WordPress, whether it's on an internal assessment or a web app or something, I, it's pretty good because you can find juicy stuff pretty easy. Uh, and so built into Kali, you have a, tools like WordPress Scan that specifically scan WordPress for outdated plugins, outdated versions. You can even, even enumerate usernames, which helps you for brute, with brute forcing later. And uh, there's also tools, again, for like Drupal and Joomla, things like that. So they're just focused scanners for those frameworks. He was mentioning some tools. Uh, here's one. OWASP has uh, a few tools out there. Zap, uh, Directory Buster. Uh, this just brute force um, directories, files, uh, etc. So if you're still not very familiar with command line, there's, there's some uh, GUIs even for uh, out there for Kali. Yeah. And uh, just a little bit more on, on Durbuster. Sometimes if I've kind of hit a wall and I'm kind of finding some, it, finding it a little harder to find things to go after, what I'll do is I'll run Durbuster. You can specify lists of like known directory names, very large lists. Uh, you can also specify file extensions to look for. So if it is PHP website, you can have it look for .php or .bak because it's pretty popular for people to change the file extensions to .bak or similar things like that. And so it will go through and it will look for those and it'll do an enumeration like, uh, you know, air, like the 200 response or error 404 and so on. So that's how it knows if those things exist or not. Uh, it takes time, especially if you have a large list it's running against, but it can really pay off. Yeah, also you can look up like PDF files or Word documents. Um, it, it's amazing, but you'll see a lot of uh, companies will upload their vulnerability scans online and they're externally facing. So maybe you want to drop in some Google dorks or something or use a tool like this to start crawling that site for PDFs or these documents and, and looking at some of the vulnerabilities of the past. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, as Brim mentioned, there's a lot of stuff in Kali. Um, a lot of pre-installs. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, just go to the, the drop-down menu. You'll see web application, web vulnerability scanners, and, and tons of things on there. Um, in addition to this, you'll also see other uh, commercially available uh, scanners out there like Nexpose and Saint, Acunetics. I mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. uh, there's several tools out there. And the ones we're just dropping, again, is just the tools that we prefer that kind of our go-to. But don't limit yourself to just these. Yeah. And it's, it's good to use multiple tools because you'll get <coughs> different results. Even if they have the same setting, just their scan engines might be slightly different. And so you'll get different results a lot of times. Okay, uh, continued talking about automated scanning. A few pro tips. You don't just want to throw in the URL and hit go. You want to look at the settings. You want to make sure that um, you're not going to flood the host with too many threads, too many connections at once. Uh, you want to make sure that you're also not enabling denial of service checks. Uh, I don't think that we've ever had a client that says, oh yeah, sure, please check for denial of service and knock something over if you can. Most of them don't want to be bothered with that. If you do have a scanner that checks for it, then just let them know, hey, we this is showing that the potential for that is there. Check it out. And some of them will say, OK, uh, just let us know if it's there, but don't exploit it. Yeah, safe mode is uh, yep. a lot of those. You'll see safe mode for the denial of service uh, exploits that it attempts to, to run. Uh, so what that does, it just checks for the response. It doesn't actually uh, deliver the payload or, or anything like that. Yep. Uh, pro tips, again, um, add any page functions the client has asked you to avoid. Um, you know, Brent mentioned before the email submission form or the contact form. Um, again, you don't want some administrator uh, getting their inbox flooded by your automated tools. So make sure you exclude that if you have to, sign up pages. Um, you know, you might need to specify a page not found error uh, to, for false positives. So yeah. if this is a kind of a gray box or white box, uh, approach to the assessment, then you're in this constant communication with the client. Uh, so it's okay to ask them these kinds of questions. Uh, if it's a black box, then obviously you want to go back and keep testing it manually just to see, hey, why is this shooting this error? What do the headers look like? And such. Yeah, um, so anybody in here that has done automated scanning, 
against a website and every single thing it sends, you get a response, like a, like a, a 200 okay, that everything it checks for is there. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah, it's a pain in the butt to clean up and it's a, it's a waste of time. So uh, several automated scanners allow you to go in and specify Okay, even though this is saying 200 okay, this is actually their custom, like, their custom response to something that isn't found. Uh, a lot of sites where if you request something that's not, not there, it will automatically take you to a home page or something. And so when you have a scanner that's sending thousands and thousands of requests looking for files, it's going to say, yeah, we're all here, but it's not really there. So you can actually go and specify uh, a custom I guess you, the 200 okay, but you'd call it like the, the page not found or whatever the, the, the scanner calls it, so. Uh, also for this, if you're doing, uh, again, if you're doing kind of a, a disclosed assessment with the client and they provide uh, credentials for the, the site, um, oftentimes instead of just, you know, sitting there trying to crack the site, if it's not a black box assessment, you're testing Windows Limited, uh, they'll just provide you a normal user or an administrator account and then you can test it from there. So that way they get a more uh, robust uh, view at their application. So whenever you're doing that, make sure um, that some of these tools have macros you can configure, others you can just dump usernames and passwords into it. Uh, but make sure that when you're running these automated scans, if you are doing an authenticated scan, that you're not dumped off. So let's say you're doing it and then the session drops and it's still running all these scripts. Well, now it's running and generating a bunch of errors because it's, the session is no longer available. So make sure that those sessions are still active whenever you're doing authenticated uh, web vulnerability scans. Yeah, and that's uh, a good thing about IBM, the IBM app scan, is that it detects when the session has dropped and it will actually pause itself until it has learned that it has authenticated again and then it will resume. So that's very handy. So, and then once you've verified everything and you're ready to go, then obviously then when you're comfortable, then click scan for or go for it. So, um, so we're going to start getting into a little bit more manual testing. So once the scanner's finished, again, you have to, you have to go through and manually verify the results. You can't rely on a scanner that everything is accurate. Uh, so you want to go through and look at, you know the things that are legitimate document those so let's say let's say you find uh, cross-site scripting or the scanner finds cross-site scripting is it you know and it's just the alert one or alert xss see how how much further you can take that can you start including in javascript where you can activate a key logger or you know do some sort of uh, file inclusion or what can you do to take it further than just the alert one and if you do the alert make it worth the alert. Do like a document cookie or document dot cookie or something like that. Try to get a, a session cookie out of it. Don't just have, oh, it says it's vulnerable because I was able to make a, a cross site scripting. I can make a some pop up and say, hey, look at me. Yep. That's not. I mean, who cares? Take it further. Push yourself. Don't limit yourself on just. That's what a vulnerability scanner does. Don't limit yourself on just that. Actually, uh, you know, try to pen test it. Yeah, and something to keep in mind too. Some of the people that are going to be looking at your report are maybe C-level people that don't fully understand what they're looking at. So if they just see a one, they're going to think, okay, well, why do I care about that? But if they see something popping up where it's like, okay, here is an active key logger, that might, you know, get their attention more where perhaps the department that's having you do the assessment can get more funding or more budget to actually uh, have more time to fix these vulnerabilities. So just kind of keep that in mind too when you're writing your report. The more eye-opening the exploit is, the better chance that you're getting executive buy-in to remediate these issues too as the client. So when you just bring a client, uh, you know, earlier we mentioned just dumping a vulnerability scan and saying, hey, uh, you know, C CSO or CTO, here's the report. Okay, cool. I see a chart with some highs and lows, whatever, fix the highs. That's not how that should work. Um, and that's why all these vulnerabilities are out there too, is because you know, some people just accept that. Always push it, make it eye-opening. I mean, don't take down their system, but make it eye-opening. Make them say, hey, that's what these guys can do. Imagine what the guys in Russia or China that, have, that are funded uh, can do, right? Again, uh, back to Burp Seat Pro. I like to use this for manual like manual testing, 
So it's a proxy app where everything I request in the browser is stored in this application so I can look at everything that I've sent and all the responses. Uh, so there's a cool tool that a lot of automated scanners have too, with spider, the spidering option. So you load the application and anything that's linked within the code, it will just go and spider that and start caching it so that you don't have to take the time to try and make sure you click on every possible link or resource within the application. When you guys are doing this too with these spidering, um, make sure you're paying attention to the scope. So let's say example.com is, is the web application you're testing. Well, example.com may have a bunch of other stuff on there, like built into it, like Facebook, uh, Connect, or yeah, Google, yeah, or Twitter, or things like that. Akamai may be on there, whatever. Make sure that your, your scope is still your scope, that it didn't add these things when it started crawling, and now when it starts running the tests and throwing fuzzing uh, parameters and stuff like that at it, that it's not hitting uh, something that's outside of scope. So yeah. always pay attention to, uh, that's why it's nice to have those proxies and even your live headers and things like that. Yep. Um, a few things you want to look at, review the response that you're getting. A lot of times it will tell you what's running. So is it running IIS or Apache? And a lot of times even go, it will go even further and tell you the version that it's running. So then you can go and check and see are there any you know, exploits in the wild that I can use here and try and leverage you know, this, this vulnerability, maybe get shell or something. So bash bug, is it, you know, is it vulnerable to shell shock? Uh, you can find those things out simply a lot of times by finding out what's running on the server. Uh, parameter fuzzing, you know, is in a p input sanitization on there? Is, uh, is it validating uh, any input of foreign characters? How does the uh, application respond to that? If you can generate a, a SQL error, then hey, well, maybe be vulnerable to SQL injection because I put a tick in here, one equals one or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so make sure that you're looking at that. That's what's nice about uh, this as well. Uh, parameters can be uh, uh, found in the URL as well, so don't just look at the tool, look at the URL, what's it doing. Try to understand the, the application's functionality and how it's communicating. Yeah, so you know, as Tim mentioned, let's say, let's say there's a zip code input on a form and it's expecting a zip code. Well, can you put, you know, alphanumeric, can you put special characters in there? Uh, something that it's not expecting, so you want to you want to give these, these input fields things that they aren't expecting, just to see how you can get it to act differently than what it's supposed to. Uh, and then again, um, kind of adding to if they, are po if they are passing sensitive information like the username or password through a GET request, that's a vulnerability. A anything that's sensitive like that it needs to be sent over a POST request. Uh, again, because if it's, if it's sent through a GET request and it's cached on the machine, and someone goes and does forensics or their machine's compromised, then all we have to do is go look and we can see, okay, example.com forward slash, you know, username equals and then password equals. And so you've given us the credentials right there. So check and see how they're actually passing these sensitive, this sensitive information. Do they have, uh, you know, file submissions on the application as well? So how are those being passed? What kind of file types can you upload uh, to that? Can you do remote file inclusion? Can you upload a PHP script on there? Is it sanitizing? Is it specific? Uh, so test for that. See if you can upload a malicious, uh, a malicious script or payload there. Uh, Burp Suite has uh, several lists also for enumeration. So um, in addition to the built-in uh, functions and lists on a lot of these automated tools, there were several resources out there for uh, downloading and making your own or adding to it. So again, just don't limit yourself to the out of the box mentality. Yeah, and again, uh, like OWASP, for example, they have a huge list of all these uh, these strings that you can pass to test for cross-site scripting. So, you know, go download that list and run it through against a parameter through Burp Suite or something else that allows you to throw a custom dictionary at it. Um, yeah, so if you want to go uh, to this, the next slide, we can see, so uh, this is just a, a screenshot of Burp Suite, and you can see uh, when you send something to the intruder function, it will automatically pick up on each parameter. So if you want to look at all the parameters at once, I, I personally don't recommend doing them all at once. I kind of like to focus in on one at a time. And so you can specify what parameter you want to look at. 
And then on another screen, that's where you load your, your list. So if you are looking for SQL injection or, again, cross-site scripting or uh, trying to discover file types or something, uh, that's just kind of what the screen looks like to specify those. So when you are doing this as well, make sure that um, you know, you're looking at these parameters. So if you just automatically d use Intruder or something like that and burp and you plug it in there, it may just find the, the equal and then it's going to start attacking that. So make sure that you modify this to attack just the parameters you want. So maybe you don't want the session cookie to be uh, fuzzed because you're authenticated, right? So make sure that uh, you're looking at that. And if you're, again, if, the, if you're new to all of this, and this sounds pretty foreign, uh, this sounds kind of generic, but make sure you Google on how to use Burp Suite and things like that. There are so many free videos and tutorials and things that you can download that will walk you through and teach you exactly how to do everything that we've mentioned already. So uh, an, a manual scanner that I like to use from time to time is Xenotix by OWASP. I think it's only available for the Windows platform, uh, but it will emulate three different browser types at once, and it will go through and, and look at specific parameters or every single parameter, and will fuzz, and, and it will actually play it in real time as if it's actual human doing it, and that way you can get a real, an actual pop-up or whatever it's sending instead of having to just look at it through code. So it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty useful. Uh, save the posts and get request uh, SQL map uh, if you guys have ever used that it's a great tool for SQL injection so you're putting those requests into it and you just kind of plug it in and again it finds those parameters and it'll start attacking uh, is sensitive information being passed you know he mentioned earlier is it being passed through uh, is it get or is it a post request uh, the passwords, the session ID, username, etc. So if somebody's sniffing on the network, maybe also maybe it's running on port 80. So maybe they don't have a certificate authority on there. It's not SSL, and you're able to just sniff those credentials as people are logging on to it. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, look for uh, valuable comments in the source code. Uh, oftentimes, if you view source, uh, you just look at the source code on there, you'll see some comments made by developers uh, about the functionality of the application, but um, you also might find some nice source code in there too that mm -hmm. will help you understand more about how the application functions and passes uh, information. Yeah, there's there's actually been several times where uh, developer comments, you know, we're kind of talking back and forth to each other just to remind themselves this does this and then it will do this but not, if, you know, and so on. We've found, again, we found credentials, we found uh, admin credentials, and we've also found the database username internal IP addresses and things that have, have helped us tailor our attacks so and now to uh, kind of prevent death by PowerPoint I'll give you this <coughs> come on guys it's cute oh oh <laughs> okay uh, a little bit more about manual testing some things you want to look at uh, Something I like to point out is, is when you're looking at these applications, look at it as an unauthenticated user. What can you see? Now look at it as an authenticated user. So during the kickoff call, you want to ask, OK, if you're going to give me credentials, I want admin level credentials, and then I want you know, standard user credentials. And the reason you do that is so that you can look at this application again as what does an unauthenticated user see? Are there links in the source code? that you're hiding visually through JavaScript, but if I look in the source code, I can still see the admin links. You know, is that stuff in there and can I access it as an unauthenticated user? As a non-admin user, am I able to get to those admin level functions? So these are, you know, sort of basic uh, privilege escalation things to look at. But just keep in mind that you want to look at this application from uh, any any different level of authentication or unauthentication that you can. It's, what's good about this too is that if you have an admit account or just any account really, can you use that account again? Can you open up an, your VM and then pop it in another browser or Xenotix or something like that and, and uh, bounce, use the same session over and over again? So uh, especially admins, you know, you get the admin password, uh, someone else is on there doing what they're supposed to be doing, but you log on as well, so now, uh, you know, it's the same it's handling multiple sessions for that same user. So that's something you want to test for as well. 
uh, in the password reuse. If you did find uh, an old password, um, can you use that same password again? Can you change it back to the old password? How are they uh, handling uh, authentication, user credentials, um, password expiration and such? Yeah, so why is it a big deal if you can, if the same user can log on at different multiple locations at the same time? Well, you kind of have to look at it from use case. So if this is a bank and you're logged in and someone else logs in and it kills your session, then you know something's up. Okay, why did I just get logged out of my account? Something's going on here. But if they don't terminate that session and they allow multiple sessions, that could be an issue. Let's say uh, that someone does have your credentials and they're looking at your account at the same time you are, that's, that's something that you want to report. Log off features as well. Does it automatically log you off after so much inactivity? Or does it just stay there? Are you on there and you forget to log off and oh my gosh, you walk away from your system and someone now has access to your account on your system. You didn't lock your system perhaps. Yep. So um, these are things also, especially if you steal a session cookie. So you get uh, a document cookie to pop up, let's say with the cross-site scripting, and then you see that, you know, hey, this is a legitimate session cookie, and then you use that. Well, if, again, like Brent said, it doesn't knock them off, and now you're, you're kind of piggybacking on that session. Yeah, there's actually been uh, several assessments where I've sniffed traffic and I've been able to get the session cookies and you know see what site they were looking at. Uh, one of them, well, I can't say the name of it, but um, and I was able to actually go in and, and just sort of re throw in the session cookie and had access to the same account that they had and was able to get some pretty sensitive information from that client. So, so don't just look at the application as well. Uh, you know, depending on the scope, maybe uh, the host isn't within scope, but. Uh, if it is, at least look at the services that are running on it. Uh, what version of Apache is running? What version of IIS, et cetera? Are they doing patch management? Are these vulnerable to some exploit out there that I can now gain a interpretive shell or something like that? Uh, so don't just limit yourself to the application uh, whenever you're looking at these. Look at the hosts as well. Um, you know, also when you're doing the crawling and the spidering, is there an admin portal? Is that available? Is it publicly facing? Uh, you know, again, cPanel uh, is a good example. Yeah, Can Apache, you, yeah. like default. We found default creds on uh, Tomcat several times, and we were actually able to go and deploy a malicious, like the laudanum script, the war files, and get shell on the host just because they had default creds on uh, Tomcat. Same with, uh, with cPanel. Can you brute force that with the username that you found or, you know, a known, a known list like rockyou.txt, a, a good password list. Or, so just, you know, just think, kind of think outside the box. Like, like Tim said, don't just look at the application, but look at the host as well, because that will, a lot of times you can leverage that. <clears throat> so again, we're kind of starting to repeat ourselves a little bit here, but uh, look for dangerous HTTP methods. There have been quite a few times where, because of how the application was set up, that they had the put and delete enabled, so we put our own script up there and it actually ran and so we had a shell or we could, we could browse directories on the host and things like that. So uh, look at those things, make sure you document it, obviously let the client know. And if you're not familiar with like some of these HTTP methods, uh, NMAP, uh, there, there's a NSE script on there for, for testing these so you can see if it's got debug or put or anything like that enabled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Um, again, we talked about earlier, look at the SSL TLS settings. Are, do they still have TLS 1.0 or SSL 3? Are they, uh, and do they have super like really weak ciphers enabled? Uh, what's their signing, you know, is it weak signing? Uh, so you want to look at all these things. And again, all, the, all these tools are built into Kali too, uh, like test SSL. Um, and what's the other SSL, SSL check? Yeah, SSL check. Um, so there, there are quite a few that are on there as well. And I know Qualys has a website that you can throw on there, but be careful about that because the client might not be happy about you running their website through this. Uh, so just check with them if you're going to use a public tool like that. Uh, again, look for file uploading features. You know, Brim mentioned before where we were able to upload uh, malicious files, PHP, batch, uh, Perl scripts, or something like that. So. Um, a lot of people don't think about this. Um, oh, really? Can you, you can do that? Well, yeah, you have an upload function on your website. It's letting me upload stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Let's, say, let's say that the website, 
you can edit a profile and you can add a profile picture. So obviously you have to upload your profile picture. Well, if it says that JPEG or something, uh, are they actually sticking to that? Are they sanitizing that? Because there have been so many times where we do, let's say if it's PDF upload, so we'll do, uh, like it'll be shell.php.pdf. And so all they're looking at at the end is .pdf, but the server ignores that, so it actually runs the script, and again, that's another shell on that host because they weren't sanitizing that file upload. So, you know, you want to look at those things too. Also, Brent mentioned, uh, you know, changing it from php.pdf. Uh, so if you are doing, let's say, an external assessment or a black box assessment, scenario-based, whatever, um, you know, you want to make sure you're using measures to evade uh, the firewalls, antivirus, IDS, IPS, uh, you know, any kind of uh, detection or prevention uh, mechanisms they may have in place. And to do that, you know, one way is to change the file name or the file type. Another way, any kind of obfuscation, polymorphic code, uh, file extension changing, you can wrap, you know, malicious files and, and name it a PDF, uh, stuff like that. So if you guys also are uh, on the defensive side, if you see a PDF in there and that PDF is like one page and it's several megs, why? That's weird. So make sure, you know, why is that, that small file, small file so big? Um, so that's a way to kind of detect that too. Yep. And again, um, as we mentioned before, methodologies, especially if you're new to this, uh, look at it, see what all the best practices are, you know, for, for testing all the errors to look at. Uh, it's a great way to stay on track. Don't ever use a tool that you've never used before. Or try something that you haven't tried before on a client site, especially if it's a production server, because if you're not exactly sure what it is, and you break something and they come, you know, call you or panic or come running into the room if you're on site and say, oh my God, the building's on fire, what did you do? And then you say, uh, well, I'll, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's never a good thing. So, I know it's a scatter twisting tool. <laughs> yeah, just something I just downloaded from Anonymous. They said it was cool. So, uh, you know, always, always check it out. Make sure that you know what your tool is doing. Test it in a lab. Don't test it in a client environment. And then when you are all ready to go, and then you go hack some websites. So, yeah. so also, I want to add to this, uh, this uh, the practice in the lab and stuff like that. Uh, some people that aren't pen testers, perhaps you have a lab at home, and you're testing, and you're doing your own thing. And you start downloading some uh, stuff from some torrents, and they're cracked software, or cracked versions of Havage or Acunetics or something you start running that on your system. Keep in mind that a lot of these cracked versions of this applications also may have built-in um, exploits in it too. And so you may be thinking, oh sweet, I'm getting all these awesome hacker tools. Well, you're now also infecting your own system. So uh, be very careful about using kind of these, uh, these pirated software. Pirated software. Um, you know, something about Kali, what's great about uh, offensive security is that they have uh, you know, they put these tools in here and it's, they're pretty safe to use as far as uh, knowing that there's not a rat built into it or something. So I think we have uh, a few minutes left. We want to make sure there's time for any questions that you all might have. And if you're not comfortable asking us, then, you know, please come see us after our talk. Also, if you guys uh, think of any questions while you leave, feel free to contact us on Twitter at Brent W Design or at Zanshin Hacks uh, with four X because it's late. Any questions? Yeah. So you guys mentioned a couple of tools, well, several for obviously web app pen testing. Mm -hmm. Some were commercial, some open source. Um, do you have some that are free open source that you would highly recommend? Like, you can't afford to go that next step and go for that Burp Suit Pro, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Actually, so in Kali, Burp, uh, you know, Burp has the commercial version, like the free version and the commercial version, so you can use the commercial version. but. Uh, OWASP, um, you know, he mentioned uh, Xenotech, but uh, OWASP, OWASP Zap, Zap uh, is free. It's yeah, good. It's got it a lot of features to it. So, so. and it, 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 there is the free version of Burp Suite. It, obviously, it's limited in some of the things you can do, but you can get the job done. And there's other tools too, like different kind of uh, infusions that will do uh, what the commercial side does, but it's it's so it's in common. Like so yeah, it just takes yeah, a it's bit. just a little more tedious. Yeah. So not as yeah. convenient.
Yeah, so um, as far as like on the server level, I, I, what I know is that in the script, it will look for just that file extension, like in, like say, like JavaScript or something. And so then it passes it and will actually let it upload to the server level. Uh, when it's at server level, a lot of times the server will read the file name and then the first, like the first extension, and it will still allow it to execute. So does that answer your question? Also, when you're using polymorphic code or you're changing stuff, you want to make sure that it's not actually changing the, the uh, previous file, the core file, right? You don't want it to change the algorithms or anything like that on, on there. It's just kind of, it's a mask. So even with the file types, uh, oftentimes you're able to evade it because it's just a mask. You're on a, a, a Mac, for example, you know, you change the file type, it'll change the file type, right? So, um, but, but some of this, it'll, it'll remain the same as whatever that, that root file type is. Yeah, kind of like converting it from plain text to like base 64 encoding or something like that. So it's still there, it's just in a different, it's broken up a lot. So. It's, so how do, you, how do you find where the file ended up going? So when you do the upload, you want to make sure that all, all that stuff is running through uh, a proxy. And so you can actually go and see where it sent it to and follow that link to see. It. I mean, sometimes, even if you can't upload it, you don't have permissions to view it. Uh, but sometimes you do. But if you look at, at the response and, and, and everything that's being sent back and forth, you can track down where it's being sent to. So. And there's some stuff too, you can change the file name on the site after you've uploaded. You know, let's say it has like some kind of FTP function or something, you're able to browse it, then you know, you can just change. <laughs> okay, well, I've bypassed your, your filtering for the upload of file type, well now I can just change the name because I'm authenticated through your anonymous FTP or something, so. Yeah, and that's like a really crappy worst case scenario yeah, if that's, yeah. so. Yeah, hope, I hope if you're a client you don't have that. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, and this can become well versed with them before you use them. I wanted to ask you all a couple of questions. One, I had to step out for a second. I've got a sick relative I was checking on. Uh, did you talk about W3AF? No, I didn't. No, I, I, I have, I've used that before. It's been a while. Yeah. But that, I like that, that tool too. It's just the things yeah, that we use. Yeah. Is it R A W R? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of it, but I haven't used it. I'd, I'd say take a look at yeah. it. It's, that's a free, it's an open source tool? Open source. Okay. Yeah, and while we're doing questions, guys, if uh, anybody else in here is a pen tester or something, if you guys have any recommendations for, you know, some free tools and stuff. I mean, this is what these events are for, right? It's uh, knowledge sharing, getting together and just saying, hey, here's what I've done. Uh, what do you use and stuff like that. So make sure you guys are networking. Um, don't just kind of stay in your own little bubble and and talk to us because we've got our methods but you guys may have some better methods right yeah if you, if you have recommendations for us i'd love to hear that anything that can improve our skill set or uh you know time management or anything help the community yeah please let us know so. anyone else cool all right thanks guys for listening appreciate Thank it you guys.